Let's talk. Nice. Hi, Zach Jones, my good friend. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Spencer? I'll be my good friend. Ah, so nice to hear. What's the tragedy of, uh, of well, among many, <laughs> is that <laughs> for the past two months, you have been uh, 45 miles from me, and I have not seen you once. Normally, you live in Los Angeles. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, We're closer, yet still so far apart. You're so far <laughs> away. Everybody, please stay in one place <laughs> yeah. for a bit. Yeah, like a, like a year. <laughs> Just chill out. <laughs> yeah. The guy on YouTube doesn't know more than the scientists. Oh, my God. I'm not, I, I'm not even on the internet anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm just not. Like, I'm muting people left and right. Forget it. Yeah. Like, I'm, uh, I'm generally not one to go on what I guess a lot of people refer to as an unfriending spree. But yeah. definitely when, when I'm browsing and I come across, like, the conspiracy theory post, I'm just like, all right, see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> like, uh, I've only talked to you once in real life anyway. I don't yeah, need to see right. this. <laughs> Let, let's not do this. <laughs> Yeah. Let's like carry on this charade. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so I was thinking we could actually like kick it off, kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it off with a kick it, kick kick it off. I wish it was that cool. Um, <laughs> kick it off with the bull moose minute here. Oh yes, let's do that. Do you want to do the music and I'll I'll read the um. I'll read the the releases this week. Sure. Yeah, just whatever. Mouth jazz. Very good. New this week uh, from Bull Moose, the Zach Newman Band. That's a new audio CD. Uh, They are shipping. It's a rare item, but they'll try to get it for you. PR, the new rules of marketing and PR. is an audio book from David Mirren Scott. And Renee Anderson has a new CD out, as well as Denon New Releases Classics. And a Johann Sebastian Bach uh, sample CD of new Bach. Um, not new Bach, because he's not been around a while, but like a new collection of Bach tunes for young folks. You can find all of these titles at bullmoose.com. They are now offering curbside pickup at all of their locations, or they'll ship it directly to you in your home. Visit bullmoose.com for more information. Okay, I was wondering. I was wondering how you're going to finish big there. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, so this show. I mean, I guess I'll just do the whole the whole smear. Uh, this show is brought to you by Bull Moose. We just did the Bull Moose Minute. Um, you know, keep your eyes peeled to BullMoose.com for new releases uh, every week. Although it kind of like movies, it's kind of slowed down a little bit. I think everyone's like waiting to release. You know, until which point uh, people can do things, but there are still new releases. They have tons of used stuff, DVDs, Blu-rays, video games. Like, give me a break. Um, it's also brought to you by Maine Spirits. Maine Spirits bring all of the liquors and spirits into the state of Maine. You can find out more about them at mainspirits.com on Instagram at Maine underscore spirits, and they have an app for your smartphone. Zach. Yes. Do you, do you have the Maine Spirits app? I will be downloading it immediately because what two better things to get you through a quarantine than booze and multimedia? Like my sponsors are actually my real life lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to, I, I waited, I waited for the right sponsors and now, man, I'm glad I did because it'd be, if I was sitting here <laughs> having to like talk about like, like, I don't know, shoelaces or I don't know <laughs> what, what's hot right now. <laughs> um, my sanitizer. mind is drawing a blank. I, I am so removed from from the world. Yeah, I don't know what's what. Yeah, except for booze and multimedia. <laughs> the, only, the only two things I know. That's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my thought was, hey, hey, folks, do you like movies? Of course who you do. Doesn't because who the hell don't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Zach and I love movies and we love to talk about them. We talk about them so often. Zach Jones, by the way, uh, 
great friend of mine, uh, occasional uh, bandmate, certainly before, probably again, who knows, um, constant companion and uh, regular guest of the the show here. Um, and happy to be all of those things. Oh, God. I mean, you do it. So, it's, it's all natural, too. Nothing's forced. And uh, <laughs> I'm Zach, glad it seems that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're a performer. <laughs> Um, but, uh, we both love movies and when we used to live together in, uh, what could only be described as a dream bachelor pad, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> it was sure. It's like a real life, um, monkeys pad. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> we had a drum kit in the living room, so like, you know, um, but one thing Zach and I used to do all the time is watch movies. In retrospect, had we done more uh, work, we probably would be further along in our careers. <laughs> we'd, we'd be living comfortably in all the money we made from our successful careers. <laughs> That's right. And then could watch movies in our home theater, but no. <laughs> yeah. um, but one thing Zach and I know about each other is that we have nearly exactly the same taste in movies, although our tastes and favorites skew a little bit, you know, left and right here and there, the, the fundamental core is effectively the same. So what I challenged Zach with, challenge, wasn't much of a challenge. It, <laughs> it literally took me 30 seconds to write mine down. Um, and uh, so I've chosen my top five movies, in no particular order, just top five movies. And I'll, I'll say with my list, I could definitely do top 50 you know what I mean? It's a really oh, ridiculous uh, endeavor to try to narrow it down to just five. But but if I did, I just kind of like closed my eyes and freed my mind and just like wrote down my boom 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 like first best instincts. And uh, I I'm looking at the list now, and uh, I stand by all of them, even though I know there are some omissions. But I'm wondering. <laughs> Imagine if you looked at your top five list 30 seconds after writing it down and said, I don't stand by one of these anymore. <laughs> Mannequin 2. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Dirty work. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm wondering if, Zach, yours, I wonder how similar they are. So uh, so what we're going to do here is each bring up a movie and if the if it's on your list, identify that right, and then mm -hmm. we'll uh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about why, in, in my opinion, every movie that I've I've put down here is flawless. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm curious what your five are. Um, do you want to go first, being the guest? Uh, sure. Um, I, I'm going to give a little quick setup, I guess. Please, um, please. As you know, I am a a big fan of movies. Mm -hmm. I watch lots of them. I have seen most of the David Lean epics. I've seen you know all of the Hollywood era Hitchcock films. You know, I, I I have watched lots of real cinema as as much as I've watched lots of trash cinema. <laughs> and uh, when I think of my top five movies, like without you know when you gave me this challenge yesterday, like without even whatever, having to, to consider them at all. All of the, the five movies that popped into my head are the same movies that I loved when I was like six years old. Yeah, six, <laughs> <laughs> yeah because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this this is not a list for eye-rolly uh, hipster critics. Like, <laughs> yeah. get, get the fuck out of here if that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. We love yeah, these my, movies. We love these movies uh, our whole lives. Yeah, my, my top five list apparently hasn't changed since like 1984. <laughs> that's what it turns out. Yeah, mine. Yeah, actually, I'm looking at mine. I, I mine, mine is 1986. So, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many movies that like I'm just like now that I'm like looking at this list, I'm like, yeah, but what about? But what about? But what about? But you can't. It's, oh, totally. It's five. You we can only, do that all day long. We've only got an hour or so here. Yeah. Like, you know, like let's, right. let's I'm not gonna be throw out a movie. Uh, I'm gonna throw out a movie that's. Uh, I know for a fact is on your top five list. And mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll hang up and you can call somebody else to be on this podcast. <laughs> okay. Uh, going back to 1984, Ghostbusters. The greatest horror comedy of all time. Nothing will touch it moving forward. Nothing has touched it since. It yeah, created absolutely. the genre. 
created the genre. Well, I mean, that's not fair because I mean, there were those like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein movies and all those kind of things. And like, <laughs> yeah, but did those ever really fit into the like the horror category? Did they scare anybody? Yeah, <laughs> like, Ghostbusters actually has some scary parts. It sure does. We were actually talking last <laughs> night with a um, a friend with children or a child, and. When I was his age, I watched Ghostbusters and obviously like loved it so much. Um, but then we, through our discussion, we kind of learned that uh, he actually really has a hard time with scary movies. And, mm-hmm. and, and my thought was how awesome it would be for me and hopefully him to bring him to the new Ghostbusters when it come, it was supposed to come out now. Um, mm-hmm. but Or soon, uh, but it's been pushed yeah, back, back. Back when we used to get movies. Yeah, the before times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like I, we, I keep tuning into like iTunes to see like what's out. It's like ooh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nothing new, huh? <laughs> like, you know? and I get it, but also it's just like yeah. somebody put out a put out a freaking movie for crying out loud. Yeah, I mean, if, if we get a Zoom movie, I'm gonna be Pissed. so disappointed with Furious. the world. Yeah, like, like why can't they just like start releasing like those those uh, like pilots that never made it to air, like the you know. I don't know, just things that would be at least interesting to watch um, without any obligation, right, to move forward mm-hmm. with them. But, uh, yeah, Ghostbusters. I saw that in the theater. Oh, the reason I was talking about the kid earlier is because, like, of what you noted even earlier than that, which is this movie does genuinely have some truly scary shit in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, even now, like, knowing it's coming. Like, I've, I've seen this movie. I've seen Ghostbusters... Un, untold, an uncountable hundreds of times. I don't. I don't even know. Six hundred. I don't know. Probably. I mean, I feel like that's is at least how many times I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> we taped it off of a uh, ABC. I saw it in the theater when it came out, and was just like blown away. Like I just wanted to live there, and then it was on ABC, and I taped it, and. I, that's the, the version that I watched hundreds of times. I'd come home every day from school and put it on, like, every day. Mm-hmm. And uh, watching the theatrical release afterwards, it, it actually kind of threw me off because they that, that was back in the day when they wouldn't just, like, overdub um, mm-hmm. language. They'd shoot different scenes. Oh, yeah. So that whole meeting with the mayor, for instance, is, like, a completely different set of dialogue, which when I watched it, you know, in, in my twenties or whatever, when it, whenever it came out on DVD or whatever, um, mm-hmm. it was like, wait, what? <laughs> it just kind of blew my mind. It's like, <laughs> like if the B side to Abbey Road had like a, a different song on it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what is, what is your so, what are your thoughts on Ghostbusters, Zach? So uh, my introduction to Ghostbusters, I think, uh, you know, I, I I got into it a couple of years after it came out. Um, just because, uh, you know, I'm younger than you. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I, th- I think I was introduced to, like, the characters through the the TV show, The Real Ghostbusters, first. Yes. And, like, I knew the brand and obviously knew the theme song and knew that. And the, the TV show to me was obviously, like, a silly Saturday morning cartoon, like, fun, good time thing to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was already just on board with the Ghostbusters from that. And then when I saw the movie... I think as a kid, I never viewed it really as a comedy because I didn't get most of the jokes. Yes. Uh, I just saw it as a scary movie. I mean, it was definitely like, you know, compared to the the cartoon that I knew the characters from, it was like a really dark interpretation of this. And yeah, they're genuinely, genuinely scary moments. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it wasn't until, you know, much, much later that I was like, wait a minute, every single line of dialogue in this movie is the most genius comedic Un- line ever committed to, to screen or paper? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, between the the apparently the the script that that Dan Aykroyd uh, handed in initially was like five hundred pages and would have cost you know so many hundreds of millions of dollars, like impossible to shoot in nineteen eighty. Yeah, yeah, they're jumping through time and space. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Harold Ramis was brought in to tighten it up, and you know. And he's like, how about New York instead of the universe? You know? um, <laughs> and, you know, thank goodness they brought him in because Harold Ramis is, I mean, top comic writer. I don't know. Like, he's one of the top. He's just absolutely he's a genius. Yeah. And he can take 
Dan Aykroyd's crazy, crazy ideas and be like, <laughs> <laughs> let's just make this work. Mm -hmm. And then the perfect combination yeah. of the great character actors that they, they did have. Uh, Rick Moranis is amazing. Annie Potts is amazing in that movie. Um, Ernie Hudson's awesome. Like, as like, I mean, he, you really believe him when he comes in, like what the fuck? Oh, absolutely. Like, I'm just trying yeah. to get a job. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, yeah I like his role is like the every man is is perfect mm -hmm. you know? like mm -hmm. yeah as long as there's a steady paycheck in ball involved i'll believe, believe anything you say, say. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean the, the the there's not a wasted uh line of dialogue in it and that's also awesome considering that they kind of gave bill murray some free reign to kind of improvise and they're able to write around that as well mm-hmm um, but man, yeah, it's also brilliant that, you know, Bill Murray was obviously the top of his game, but they saw that mm -hmm. and were like, let's just let him roll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sure there were times where he was difficult to work with and stuff like that, but it's like, you know, kudos to yeah, the other people working with him to be like, this guy is going to make our film work even more than it already does. Let's just let him do his thing. Yeah. I can't imagine. It was originally conceived, uh, as like a follow up to blues brothers as a, uh, a Belushi Ackroyd vehicle and and also mm -hmm. um eddie murphy the the, the winston yeah. part was written for eddie murphy um which he he had a good year that year anyway with yes, Beverly yes, Hills <laughs> um so that was probably a good choice for him not to yeah take the i also think that uh you know eddie murphy is so like he demands so much attention as a performer especially during that era mm -hmm. that i think had he been on board we probably would not have gotten the bill murray performance that we got because there just wouldn't be room for like that much like zaniness yeah yes you know eddie murphy's eddie murphy is a commanding lead yeah you know what i mean and 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 when he does fit into a like a supporting role um it's usually when he's also still playing the lead and then also does the supporting role <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> he's a lot of person for one movie yeah um there's one line that i always go back to uh one joke that I don't know why it's maybe it's the, the stupidest joke in the movie, but it's like my favorite. It's at the end when they're getting ready to ascend to the final thing with like you know Gozer and all that, mm -hmm. and a staircase presents itself like with light streaming <laughs> down and mist coming down and and where do these stairs go? They go up. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's the best. I think one of the one line that sums up like how crazy that whole movie is to me is when the cops have picked up Lewis Tully and they're dropping him off at the Ghostbusters and Janine comes out and she goes, picking up or dropping off? Yeah. <laughs> like, it, like it's normal for the police to, to, to bring crazy people to the Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or that the people that work there are going to get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> like, namely, like Bill Murray, right? Yeah. Like I was walking uh, down the street the other day, and this I, this actually ties into Ghostbusters too. But um, there was they were like some construction guys over the manhole with like the little tripod, like lowering a thing down. And mm. I almost wanted to like make a joke to them, like, "Oh, it's like Ghostbusters. You guys got your permits, you know?" Like, and, uh, and then I realized that they wouldn't think that's funny because they're just do doing their job. Yeah, they're actually doing their job. <laughs> and yeah. possibly haven't even seen Ghostbusters, too. <laughs> yeah. Or if they've been on the job since the late 80s, they've probably heard that joke before. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so what rules about Ghostbusters? The writing, the story is sound, the characters are incredible, the ensemble cast is one of the finest ever assembled. Sigourney Weaver, I haven't mentioned her yet. Like, way to oh, bring yeah. in a, like, a really brilliant actor to, like, tie it down. Like, she, she's, she's the, I don't believe any of this shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yet it is the victim of it. Um, but just like the comic foils, uh, you know, Walter Peck, <laughs> who's like, you know, <laughs> just like a classic dick, you know, the mayor, like yeah. all, all of the 80s cops and stuff are great. Yeah. Um, the car is great. The technology is great because it feels homemade. And the special effects are, I mean, they still hold up. And, and I... I recognize like, okay, like the, the dogs and everything are like animated stop motion, mm -hmm. but like, I like it. I like, it has a vibe. I know it's not like CGI photorealistic, but it, 
you know, we're talking. Um, one of the things that I just learned very recently, like within the last year, mm. um, about the special effects in that movie is like that was, you know, that the whole production of that movie was a battle to keep it within budget. That's and right. Even getting the budget that they had was, you know, <laughs> was like pulling teeth. Right. Um, so apparently the special effects house they hired to to put those shots together would send over like the test shots and be like, all right, this is what we came up with. How's this look? And then we'll go back and do the real thing. And Ivan Reitman would just take those test shots and put them in the movie and be like, all right, that's good. We got it. No shit. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, they had, I mean, so, I think they started off with a budget of $15 million, which got expanded to 25. Um, the reason that they um, had budgetary kind of concerns and problems uh I've just read recently a book called Wild and Crazy Guys, which I've talked about on the show, which outlines this era of comedy, right? Um, and the success of their movie, like Animal House obviously kicked it all off, and then like um, uh, European, not European, uh, National Lampoon's Vacation yeah, was a regular. huge hit, right? All yeah. of a sudden, like these fringe comedies were becoming like giant monster hits, and um, Blues Brothers was a movie that you love. And I'm gr- I'm warming on <laughs> warming up to over the years, Orange Whip, uh, but uh, that movie's budget like went like crazy, right? And mm-hmm. the the studios were super nervous because like they're spending, I mean, at that time like like a Marvel movie amount of money, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> on a comedy, um, but it turned out to be a success. So that was all like it was all good, right? Then mm-hmm. pivot to 1941. Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, and a, just a huge ensemble cast. It's a quote comedy, quote comedy, mm-hmm. directed by Steven mm-hmm. Spielberg, and it, it is a a failure um, of epic pro- proportions. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> um, the movie doesn't work. Uh, it didn't make money. It lost a lot of money. So, you know, there was like a little bit of a love lost there with the you know the genius of Aykroyd proving to be fallible, right? When it came mm-hmm. to uh, movies and um you know so this this concept of busting ghosts like through space and time um was i think they, obviously they were interested in it but like um and the success of ghostbusters actually led to the movie uh nothing but trouble wherein mm-hmm. dan Aykroyd got to like he ran that whole he like wrote it produced it directed it and was probably the only person who went to see it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I saw that when I was like, I saw that movie when I was at the age where you would think it was awesome just because you're that age. And I was yeah. just like, this movie's bad. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen that movie from beginning to end. I feel yeah. like that's a movie that you just used to be on TV all the time when I was yep. a kid. So I just turn it on and watch it from wherever it was. Right. But I've never actually like started it and finished it. It, uh, yeah, it is a misguided uh, <laughs> uh, endeavor. But uh, yeah, all the special effects. I think they used the same effects house that had just finished doing uh, Return of the Jedi. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, with all the stop motion stuff and like the speeder bikes and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, So all that stuff like looks. I mean, it looks fantastic. I think it has a vibe and it holds up, and the jokes hold up. I mean, there are certainly some certain languages and um, eh, roles in the movie that might be different now, but uh, mm-hmm. I don't think anything that's rooted in, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure somebody could point out something that I'm missing because I'm just not looking for it, but, mm-hmm. you know, I, there, there aren't too many cringeworthy movie, moments no. in that movie. Well, it, it, I mean, as crazy as the whole premise is and everything that happens in the movie, it still also somehow like manages to capture the time period and place from which it takes place. Mm-hmm. So even some of that, that cringeworthy stuff, it's just like, yeah, that is a pretty accurate picture of, you know. Yeah, New York in the mid 80s. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. And then uh, uh, I would say there is one one joke in that movie that if I could go in there and, and just cut out this one section, I feel like it would improve the movie. What <laughs> this do you is got? my only only gripe. And it goes by so quick, but they draw like attention to it that uh when Dan Aykroyd gets his ghost BJ. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> for some reason like I didn't get it when I was a kid and now I watch it and I'm just like, this is weird. <laughs> like, yep, yep. Um like, funny enough, like as we were discussing earlier, I watched I grew up on the the taped from T V version. And so mm-hmm. I, I can assure you that the movie holds up without it because I grew up without it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I saw it in the theater. It didn't make any sense to me because uh, I was a kid. And then, mm-hmm. 
then quickly forgot about it as I watched it over and over again with that scene <laughs> edited out. And, and the, the other thing about that movie is also, and I was considering this too when, when discussing with my friend whether or not it's appropriate to play for her child, is I remember like you watching it and most of the jokes went over my head. I mean, there's there are plenty of jokes that I loved, like, you know, you know symmetrical book stacking. Yeah, that's right. No human being <laughs> no. would possibly <laughs> stack books like this. Um, like that's funny to a kid too, but like, mm -hmm. like all the, uh, like the, the, the adult humor, I remember mm -hmm. watching it with my parents and they were laughing and I'm like, what do you like? What, what's funny? And they're like, nothing, nothing. I'm like, yeah. no, what's funny? Like I, I wanted to know why they were laughing, but I just like, you know, it's just didn't occur to me at the time. Yeah. But as a kid, the movie was just as engaging even without understanding those jokes. Mm -hmm. like, yes. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Works on a lot of levels. It kind of like, mm -hmm. a, it reminds me of like a, uh, like a top quality Jim Henson production in that way. Like it's you mm -hmm. know, functions on a lot of levels. Yeah. Ghostbusters. Um, yeah. Ghostbusters. Yep. It's a good movie. It's a great like movie. It. <laughs> if you haven't seen, anyway, um, <laughs> I'll go next. And I, 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 Zach and Spencer both recommend <laughs> Ghostbusters. Two, four thumbs up. <laughs> Five thumbs up. What? Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and put down a movie that I, I am willing to bet is in your top five. Ooh. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> two for two. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm a lifer uh, Star Trek guy. I used to watch the show when it was on TV, and I liked it. I was like drawn to it, especially it was kind of a bond between my mother and I because she grew up with it and she liked it, and I just you know was into it for what it was. Like Mr. Spock was like a really cool character as a kid. He, he was my favorite. He's still my favorite. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I loved that show. But like I wasn't a fanatic about it. Actually, I was over in Doctor Who world at that time. But when mm -hmm. I saw, I remember at Stop and Go Video down in New York in their original location, and they had a copy of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. They had Star Trek Three, The Search for Spock, and they also had the expanded edition of the motion picture. And I, I, I was like in. So it's the movies. I'm really, when I'm talking uh, Star Trek and, and my adoration for it, um, I'm mm -hmm. really referencing the, you know, the movies from like uh, motion picture up through uh, the Voyage Home. And then additionally, mm -hmm. um, The Undiscovered Country. And I, I still will, though I agree, Zach, it has some moments that are good. Star Trek V <laughs> is a terrible movie and does not hold up. <laughs> <laughs> the only times it holds up is when the ensemble cast is like, you know, together and like they just have so much history and it's just, like, they work together, right? Yeah. But, I'll, I'll dedicate a whole episode to talking about Star Trek V. Um, don't, <laughs> don't taunt me with a good time in a pandemic. Yeah. Listenership drops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Wait, Star Trek II... How am I hearing a dial tone right now? Right, right. <laughs> Star Trek II, obviously the follow-up to the motion picture. The motion picture was directed by Ray Wise, who is... Um, a uh, veteran, not Ray Wise, but uh, not Ray Wise, uh, Robert, Robert Wise, Wise. Ray Wise. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was directed by Ray Wise from Twin Peaks, uh, which is why it's strange. Multi talented man. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, uh, Robert Wise, who brought us like the day the Earth stood still, and um, did he direct Outland as well? Uh, I don't think so. Is that the Connery movie when yeah. he's like in space? Oh uh, no, I know, I know what it is. Jerry Goldsmith uh, was in common as a. Uh, Yes. Or orchestrator. Uh, yeah, I think Ray, uh, Ray Wise, Robert Wise also did, uh, I think, the Hindenburg movie, or mm -hmm. uh, and he did The Andromeda Strain. Right, right. Uh, sound Crichton. of Music. Yeah. Oh, he did The Sound of Music? Yep. Oh, fantastic. So, obviously, like, a very uh, accomplished director, and they had talked about bringing the show. The show is uh, unceremoniously canceled after three seasons and uh, had a second life in reruns and enough fan mail went to Paramount coupled with the success of Star Wars and Paramount saying, what do we have that looks like this? <laughs> and they're like, we've got this. They're like, okay. So they made this really, I'm not going to dismiss the motion picture as a whole, but man, I wouldn't mind a few weeks in an editing room with that movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so 
I, I absolutely love the motion picture, uh, and I I understand why it doesn't uh, why it doesn't reach other people the same way it reaches me. But yes, um, I think it's a brilliant movie, but it's probably not what most people signed up for. No, uh, whether they were trying to you know relive their Star Wars experience or mm-hmm. catch back up with characters they loved from TV as kids, mm-hmm. that was probably not the movie they they yeah. sat down and intended to watch. No, it wasn't. There wasn't but, enough yeah. of them in it. There wasn't enough character, like there wasn't enough Kirk and Spock and McCoy and Scotty and Sulu mm-hmm. and and uh, actually Chekhov probably got more screen time in the motion picture than he did in the original series. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I kind of have like a vague memory of Uhura, you know what I mean? Like when I think about it, like they didn't really give her much yeah. to work with there. But like if I have one, I mean, I have a couple complaints about the motion picture, which is the pacing I think is a little, it's a little slow. Um, yeah, for sure. Like long on the special effects shots and stuff. Um, and th- if I have one co- like outright complaint, it's the costume design is very, very dated and like, it's terrible. Yeah, not in a good yeah. way. But it is beautifully shot, and uh, most of the special effects are pretty incredible. And the story, uh, I mean, it's one of those movies like I can't stop. I think about it all the time. Mm-hmm. Probably because I usually have my morning tea out of a Star Trek the motion picture mug. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, it, but it holds like a place in time for me and a vibe and everything. And I saw, obviously saw that one first because it was the first one. But then I got I rented uh, Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan to get back to the movie in question. Yeah. Um, and there's the movie that all the Star Trek fan, Star Trek fans and Star Wars like enthusiasts looking for another thing. Yes. Like, that's the movie they were looking for. It's all there in that package. It's all there. Yeah. Um, and the reason uh, I stand by this, the reason that Star Trek Two is successful is because, um, well, largely, Roddenberry was kind of pushed aside um, mm-hmm. because of how things went down with, you know, Star Trek, the motion picture underperformed. And it was super expensive. Oh, yeah. And it it's looks super safe. long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, but... So with uh, The Wrath of Khan, they brought in, like, Harv Bennett was the producer, and he kind of was, like, working on the story, but they brought in... um, Nicholas Meyer. Nicholas Meyer, who was not a Star Trek fan at all, uh, in that he didn't have any attachment to it. He didn't really... He just, like, kind of didn't care and kind of looked at it like this is just a job. And he Mm -hmm. was able to recognize the lead character's you know, the, the, the triumvirate of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy and how they interact and how important they are to each other and how they kind of, like, complete each other in various ways. And mm-hmm. he just, like, leaned into, like, you know, Scotty's heart and everything, like that whole, like, all the stuff with his nephew and just, like, how, like, heartfelt Scotty is and proud of the ship he is and all this stuff. And, um, like, every character is, like, the best version of themselves and mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's a, it's a story about people who care about each other, mm-hmm. suffering through tremendous adversity and death. And, yeah. and I've said this before on the show, and I'll say it to anybody who listens, like there are lessons I learned from that movie when I was a kid that I, I think about still to this day. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're going through a pandemic right now, and, and all day, all I can think of is the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Yeah, or the one. Yeah, um, I've uh, one one lesson which I I realize as I get older is not a lesson. Is mm-hmm. when I was a kid, I was or younger, you know, even like in my twenties, I'd think about it like I don't believe in a no win scenario, and I kind of like mm-hmm. don't like. I mean, I I I kind of in projects in my life and stuff, I'll kind of push through until like which point like I hit a definitive wall. Like when it's over, it's yeah. over. But I'm not going to just give up because it's unlikely. That yeah. what I'm trying to achieve would be possible, but the the older I've got, I realize the more it's like, oh, you definitely need to believe in a no win scenario <laughs> and pre- <laughs> yeah. prepare yourself for that inevitability. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, but that's also uh, you know the the character himself learns that lesson at the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I think yeah, his I can't remember if it's at the end of that movie or in the second movie where uh, his son confronts him and says, you know, like you never have actually faced a no-win scenario before have you Mm -hmm. like this is the first time kind of Mm -hmm. um yeah i mean which is a hell of a track record right to make it to make it that that late in his career and i also like especially watching it more recently i think that he is my age ish in Mm -hmm. or the character is you know in in that movie he's kind Mm -hmm. of like facing like 
like middle age. He's no longer like this, like, you know, swashbuckling space cowboy, yeah. you know, and having to use glasses and all that kind of stuff. And just, um, mm-hmm. they do a good job with that too. Like it carries over into, um, the one, two, three punch of, of two, three, <laughs> two, three, four. four. <laughs> yeah. The one, two, three, of two, one, three, two three, of two, three, four. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's, it's a really, I think that's one of the best, uh, suites of, of, uh, of you know franchise suites in in movie history they mm-hmm. really killed it fun Absolutely. fact and oh d- go on. did you know that uh eddie murphy very nearly starred in uh star trek for the voyage home i did not he's this is news to me yeah he's a huge star trek fan and he was like super close like i remember one of his stand-up specials has like a whole section where he's telling star trek jokes basically yes yeah, yeah. he's a huge trekkie who knew yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have made i would like to see what that would look like same that would have kicked that movie up into like see like back in back in that day too like the, the wrath of khan was the first i mean i wasn't really i didn't have history with it at that point that was like my my entry point but like mm-hmm. star trek can be really really nerdy sometimes and absolutely it's one of my biggest complaints is that a lot of the times with it especially like the next generation on it can kind of be like insider baseball and they're like, oh, the fans like this. Like, what's your name? <laughs> My name is Glebe Glorp, and I am from the planet Borbulon. And like, oh, that is not cool. It's objectively not cool. Oh, you know what I mean? That's why, like, you know, Star Trek's always walking in. Even, like, I was Star Wars, you know, Star Wars waltzes in. And like, yeah, we got wizards. It's good. It's bad. Whatever. It's magic. Have fun. You know, and here's a cool yeah. spaceship. And it's just like, oh, why can't ours be like that? And I feel yeah. like I feel like the Wrath of Khan is that moment. Like, it is. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, in Star Trek, it's like, we, if you watch enough Star Trek, you know how warp engines work. You know, yeah, like you yeah. know that it's like antimatter and matter and dilithium crystals and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, how does the Millennium Falcon work? Who knows? It just goes. <laughs> yeah, you know? No like, idea. <laughs> Even though it's like decidedly like more of like a bucket of bolts movie. Like that's one thing that's really cool about the 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 Star Wars movies or the earlier ones is that you know these all these machines look like people built them. Yeah. <laughs> and they they have things in them that break and that need to be replaced like a car, you know. Yeah. Um you know, Star Trek's like a little more like like oh, we got rid of money. Like okay, how? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like how like what's that like look like? Like how do you what do you is this Wait, is this communism in space? I'm not really sure. Like, you just, <laughs> yeah. you just have your duty. I, I think it was. I think it was maybe smart not to uh, dive too deeply into how we got there. <laughs> I, I think you know it's more supposed to lean on like what we can achieve when we move past like the divisiveness and like the the need for greed and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, trying to tear apart like yeah how humanity actually achieved that. Yeah, I think would be a show that makes a lot of people angry. There'd be a lot of YouTubers ranting about that right now. Oh yeah, Lord, I mean. <laughs> It's funny to me. And then Gene Roddenberry thinks we don't need money. Yeah. Yeah. I wants mean, to live in a communist society. Might be right. But, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, yeah, the special effects in this movie hold up. They're all done by Industrial Light and Magic. Um, <laughs> everything looks like it's super creative the way they um, the way they shot it, um, uh, the way they used their budget and utilized their budget. And all the, every special effect in this movie – uh, lends itself to the story. There are no just like mm-hmm. errant shots of, you know, ridiculousness uh, for no reason. Yeah, it's nothing gratuitous. It's all like, yeah, it serves the story. Yeah, I mean, it took time and money to create all that stuff. I think you know, it's not like, uh, not that it doesn't these days, but uh, yeah, I feel like sometimes there are like those we're just showing off with special effects. Like these movies don't have that. It's like this is happening because it needs to. Yeah, well, like um, like Ghostbusters, you know. Aykroyd had his hand slapped after lo- losing all the money, you know, whatever for or the, <laughs> yeah. the, the the monstrosity that was 1941, and mm-hmm. you know, and they it, because of their restrictions, they had to make everything count, um, and yeah. and in, in, as a result, made a better movie. I think I think like to go back to Ghostbusters for a minute to go to Ghostbusters two, not a failure. In fact, many parts quite good, but mm-hmm. it actually kind of like crumbles under its own weight of excess because they could because yeah. the first one was so successful and they projected it would be successful so their budget was higher i mean a lot of good came of that and there's also a lot of a lot of shit in ghostbusters too that's like now eh, we don't really need that but like mm-hmm. 
you know, and, and not to compare well, motion it, picture to I'm, 1941, sorry, yeah. but because it's an objectively better movie than 1941, but like, like in the same fashion, right? They, they had, yeah. they had to tighten their belts and like, you got to make a movie and this is all the money and don't, you know, don't fuck up. Yeah. Um, I, obviously, you know that I, I stand by Ghostbusters 2 quite a bit, but you're absolutely right in the, the fact that, it, you know, I think they succumbed, they succumbed to that pressure of, we made this big, excellent movie that everybody loves, and now we need to figure out a way to make it, like, bigger. And right. so, yeah, all of a sudden, it wasn't about, like, we need the special effects shot, shot because it serves this scene specifically, but just because we're trying to, like, outdo the spectacle of the one we already did. Mm-hmm. Um Whereas, yeah, Wrath of Khan is the opposite, where it's like, oh, we already had this spectacle and spent a ton of money on it, and people didn't like it, so now we got to make another one with less money and figure out how to make that work. Um, so, it was, yeah, they, I guess the, the approach to like the effects and the scope and stuff like that was more um, out of necessity. It was more focused, <laughs> I guess. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what that that was the benefit of having Nicholas Meyer walk in, uh, and you know, being able to be super objective about it. Because mm-hmm. he he didn't care, <laughs> you know? like, yeah. He just wanted to make a good movie, you know. If it, <laughs> and if, if it was a good Star Trek movie, then fine. Um, yeah. But that's like the kind uh, of but, direction that you can kind of get out of somebody who's not enamored with their subject and won't just say like, "Oh, yeah, whatever, it's great, I love it," you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, I think also some of the brilliance of you know. So again, my introduction to Star Trek was that two, three, four trilogy, mm-hmm. um, and you know now I celebrate every every corner of the star trek universe but like still that's like <laughs> and michael bolton's that, catalog <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> but that yeah that those three movies were what pulled me in and i think you know one thing that again as a kid like still hit me was the strength of those characters yes and when you go back and watch the tv show like you also see that too like the strength of that the core three but then uh in the movies they were able to flesh out the other characters even more and bring them forward yes. and, and have them more involved in the stories. Mm-hmm. But then on top of that, they were able to put more of like the own, the actor's experiences into the characters too. Mm-hmm. Like it was like, you know, uh, in the sixties Shatner was a dude who was like full of himself and, you know, was psyched to be the star of this TV show and all this. And all of a sudden he was typecast in that role and couldn't get work for like a decade afterwards. Um, oh, and I, so kinda, I he lost you. Back, there. Hey, Zach, I lost you for a bit. Oh, so if you yeah. want to just jump in with, sure. uh, in the '60s, Shatner was a character who was full of himself. Gotcha. Um, are we good to go? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So in the '60s, William Shatner was he was the star of a hit of a TV show. He was doing really well. He was kind of full of himself. You know, thought he could do no wrong. The show got canceled, and he couldn't get work for almost a decade mm-hmm. um, because he was so closely associated with the character. You know, uh, Leonard Nimoy wrote a biography called I Am Not Spock because he was so like, he had Mm -hmm. such a hard time distancing himself from that character. And so when the actors came back to those roles, like for the motion picture, you know, you have Kirk is like, you know, he's kind of like a little bit insecure. Like he doesn't want to like trust the crew and like he's like, insists on taking command of the ship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the motion picture, Spock isn't even a part of Starfleet anymore. He's on Vulcan trying to like... right you know, whatever, get away from, which is basically what Nimoy was trying to do with Star Trek in real life, is like, get away from it. Um, And they kind of worked that into the story, which then carries over into two, three, and four, like the continuation of that. And yeah, the actors getting older and kind of like settling in like their places in real life, but also like the characters in the movie, uh, like uh, Captain Kirk being like embarrassed that he has to wear glasses when he's Mm -hmm. looking at the panel, trying to figure out the code to have to, you know, bring down the shields on the... Constrict, uh, constrict. Uh, yeah. So the, all, all that stuff, I think, is just it's really strong, like character work, but also, yeah, just bringing in their personal lives into those characters mm-hmm. to make it come through even more. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, when you have like just like a story and characters that are that strong, mm-hmm. and then on top of that, you've got spaceships and lasers and mm-hmm. excellent special effects, mm-hmm. and a great, great, great musical score from James Horner. Yes, uh, I think that was like his his breakthrough kind of was scoring that movie. It's like, you can't go wrong. It's just, it's so good. We, uh, actually, I, um, there's a company called Mondo that does really cool vinyl releases. And they recently mm-hmm. over the past couple of years, uh, issued the wrath of Khan, uh, soundtrack. And I mm-hmm. put it on here at the house to listen to. And all of a sudden, like we had, we had friends over, we're kind of hanging out and, and this music is playing and we're all kind of like tense. 
I was just like, oh, hold on. I'm going to change the music. <laughs> like, of course, we're tense. <laughs> like, this is like, this is like Khan's theme or something. It was just like really just like, you know, <laughs> like alarming. And, um, but yeah, I mean, they did such a good job developing the characters in that movie that they, they were able in 2009 to pick those characters back up and recast them and have them work because the characters had been so well established in, in, mm-hmm. I think, uh, two, three, four, and I'm um, five, yeah. five. They, there's character development there too, but like six also like the uh, undiscovered country is a great send off for that crew. Yeah. So, it, that's another excellent movie too. That's, yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah. Um, all right. What do you got? What's your next one? All right. So this actually kind of ties into, uh, your Dan Aykroyd, Steven Spielberg, 1941 failure. Interesting. Theme. Um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark oh, yep. is, yeah, easily one of my top five. And uh, so uh, George Lucas, you know, came up with the character and roughed out the story and all that stuff and brought Spielberg in and they kind of roughed out the rest, brought in Lawrence Kasdan to write the screenplay. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lucas was like, he was so burned out from directing after just doing A New Hope, however many years earlier that was, mm-hmm. that he was like, I don't, I don't want to direct this. I want Steven Spielberg to do it. And I can't remember why they ended up bringing it to Paramount. There's something, I think Lucas was just bummed out with something that had gone down with Fox. You know, they had been distributing the Star Wars movies. Mm-hmm. So he brought it to Paramount and he told them that he wanted Steven Spielberg to direct. And they were like, no way. Yeah, right, <laughs> like, right. There was a time in the world, and, and yeah, there was a time when people heard the name Steven Spielberg and said, no way. Yeah. Like that guy goes over budget, has a goes wild over card. schedule. <laughs> yeah. His, his last movie was such a failure. It cost so much money. Like, right. no way. Like do it yourself or get somebody else. And uh, he stuck to his guns. He was like, no, Spielberg's directing this. And then Spielberg was just like, all right, I have this reputation now of going over budget and over schedule. And I got to break that. And this movie is going to be the thing that I do that with. So we're just going to do quick takes you know, we're going to set up, we're going to shoot, we're going to move on. We're not going to like, you know, obsess over it. Mm -hmm. And they ended up making one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest movies of all time. Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's what happens when, first of all, I, this was not in my five. So this is our first diversion. Um, but I, if, if it were 10 or if I were in a different mood yesterday, this easily could have been on my list because it is, it is a perfect (laughs) movie. There's not a wasted moment. Harrison Ford. This is what happens when people who understand good storytelling and how to film things capture actors who know how to act. You know what I mean? Like it's it's mm-hmm. everyone killing it and just like get in, crank it out, get out, and it's awesome. It has great spirit. It has a sense of immediacy. Um, I mean, just from like from moment one, you're along for the ride. You know, from yeah. moment one. And I, I remember watching. That was a movie that I watched with. Uh, we didn't see it like when it came out. It came out in eighty one, um, so I was like a little too young for it. But like as soon mm-hmm. as it was like, kind of like available for rental or something. Like back back when uh, big VHS boxes cost like ninety five dollars. <laughs> you know, but, like, yeah. We I or when you would rent the movie and the player. That's <laughs> right. The same video. That's to the, right. Uh, that's right. Same visit to the video store. That's exactly right. And then that's when uh, my mom and I fell in love with that movie together. And my, my dad was kind of like melting phrases, you know, <laughs> he didn't care. This is not appropriate for kids. Or he just didn't keep, my dad has no, That's... no truck for the, the, the fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, like I love, uh, you know, Indiana Jones is like, he's sort of like a morally ambiguous character. Mm hmm. Except for he's up against Nazis, so there's no question about who the bad guys are. That's right. <laughs> kind of like Han Solo uh, in that way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, yeah very much like that. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, just being made at a time where you could make stunt movies where you were actually dragging a dude behind a truck and, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. I'm like, you know, nowadays there's more safety protocols and there's CGIs. You don't need to harm your stuntmen. Right. But like the immediacy of like, yeah, that, like the dudes on the side of the truck getting knocked off, like when he's like going up closer to the trees right. and stuff. And right. Yeah. I'm getting like hanging off the front and getting dragged underneath and yep. all that. It's like, there's just so much, you know, intensity to those scenes. Um, and it's just fun from beginning to end. The whole movie is so much fun. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's an intelligent adventure movie which utilizes the arguably the greatest uh, film um, film bad guy of all time, which is the Nazis, you know, because. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, just like the the way the story ties together, like, the, I mean, how inspired were you as a kid, like, by this to, like, go out and, like, like you know, then, like, Goonies comes out. It's just, like all this, like, I'm going to find treasure because, of the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you find, like, totally. a thing in the dirt. Like, that must be the thing. If you yeah. put it on, it lines up at exactly the right time. And, <laughs> yeah. and just, like. I also didn't realize that, uh, like, archaeologist was, a, you know, just uncovered artifacts at dig sites and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I like, I thought it was just a guy that goes out on adventures with a whip and a pistol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to be an archeologist. <laughs> this looks great. Great. Here's your, here's your paintbrush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, here's your classroom. I, I was talking about uh, this movie just last night because I mean, I feel like I have to give it to Raiders cause it's, you know, um, it's the first, but like, I don't know, but what I, I might like um, The Last Crusade the best. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's something I, about I think, it. I think Last Crusade, it captures everything that was awesome about Raiders and also brings in Sean Connery. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And it's like, and it manages to capture everything that was great about Raiders without it feeling like a redo or like a, you know. A rehash, a, yeah. A rehash, yeah. And I'm sure, and I think the fact that Temple of Doom was so radically different than Raiders that it was like actually kind of refreshing to go back to that formula. Mm-hmm. Um, but had Last Crusade come out right after Raiders, there might be a little bit more of that. Like, oh, okay, I've already seen this. Mm-hmm. But by the time you got it, you were like, oh man, this is great. Mm-hmm. This feels so good. <laughs> yeah, Temple of Doom has some good stuff in it, but it's not. It does not h- hold its weight uh, when put up against the other no. two. And I, exactly. I mean, again, it's another movie that I absolutely love and consider it one of my favorites of all time. Sure. But yeah, when you lift it up, it's, you know, yeah. right next to the other two, it's like, yeah, more, yeah, it's definitely more Indiana Jones. Yes, please. But you know, yeah. I mean, then there's Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. No thanks. <laughs> Even though th- I, I, there's some good stuff in that one too. Yeah, it's. I still have a hard time considering that as part of the like the the trilogy but mm-hmm. again i love the characters and i have kind of come around on that movie a little bit mm-hmm. i think i was really hard on it when it first came out mm-hmm. and there are still parts that really really suck oh terrible um but overall it's not as bad as i had like built it up to be in my mind after initially seeing it no um i rewatched it it sucks <laughs> <laughs> you know i've actually watched it i think like twice in the last year and it was the first time you know the first of those two times was the first time i'd seen it since it came out and uh yeah when it was over i was like there's a huge chunk in the middle that sucks so hard mm-hmm. but the rest of the movie is pretty good i like it all right really it's, i can't get over how bad that chase scene is in crystal sky oh, the That's monkeys like, and all that the monkeys and all the CGI. Yeah. And it's just like, again, like the immediacy of Raiders, like, yeah. you know, it, the fact that you can see there's real people like on these trucks versus like, yeah. this is somebody standing on a prop in front of a green screen. Yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> it's know, not like good. Her, hair, her hair is not even blowing in the wind. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And to waste, <laughs> to waste Kate Blanchett as, as an enemy, you know, yeah. she, she's an awesome actor. Um, exactly. All right. We'll pivot away from that. And I'll just because we have more movies to go through. And um, oh, yes. this maybe shouldn't be a three hour episode. Uh, <laughs> uh, my next pick, I, I don't think it would be on yours, but like I know that you won't be surprised that it's on mine is John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are absolutely right about both those things. Yep. Uh, it when I, when I did my five second consideration of what my top <laughs> five films are. Yeah. <laughs> but that is definitely up there as one of my favorite movies. Yeah. So it, yeah. it is a, uh, if you haven't seen it, it is the tale of a Arctic crew who, um, I guess they, they discover, uh, uh, an alien being, um, well, they don't, well, it, there's a chain of events that leads to a crew that's stranded in the Antarctic, actually, I think. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, Yeah. Um, it they is, discover it, a science team that has discovered an alien right, being, right, 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 <laughs> yeah, or the remains right. of a science team, the remains of a science team, and this uh, yeah. this creature can adapt in that it, whatever it ingests, it can uh, copy. So it becomes almost like an Agatha Christie story of like you know, um, you know, you don't know who to trust or who's real or who's an alien, and uh, it's a it's a, a tremendously disgustingly gory uh <laughs> exercise in paranoia and it's a great uh great ensemble cast oh, fantastic and like putting them all in like that you know close quarters settings kurt russell yeah. wilford brimley 
Um, Richard Dysart. Keith David. Keith David. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's just the yeah intensity throughout that entire movie, just like that. Who can you trust? Mm-hmm. Feel and also, there's not even room to hide here. <laughs> We're just stuck inside these small quarters or outside in the freezing cold. Yeah, yeah those are your options: yeah. be stuck inside with the 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 thing or freeze to death. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm, huh? Kind of relevant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do I want to go outside and die or take my chances in here? <laughs> yeah. um, I might have to go watch that movie again with that in mind right no, it's, now. It's, it's, it's a beautifully shot movie. Um, it was not received well at the time. In fact, um, uh, was considered a failure, which is funny mm-hmm. to me because I think it's John Carpenter's best work. And that's saying something because mm-hmm. he's made some really, even if you, like, you take uh, the campy movies out of the picture, like Big Trouble in Little China or They Live... Um, Halloween is incredible. Um, Mm -hmm. the fog is really good. Yeah. I stand by escape from New York. I know not everybody does, but I saw that for the first time recently. Like I, um, I really finally, like, like you mentioned with uh, nothing but trouble earlier. Like I had seen pieces of it. Obviously I read a lot about movies. Um, Mm -hmm. but I just hadn't like sat down and actually watched it like top to bottom. I'd seen most all of the movie in pieces, but um, yeah, I mm-hmm. think it, it, it holds up for sure, but but not on the level to me. Like the thing is, just there's something that the soundtrack isn't it uh, Nizio mm-hmm. Morricone. Do I have that? Name? It is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, er, Ennio Morricone. Ennio. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Get it right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> just be, probably just like <laughs> it's such a common name. I know. Well, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> um, it's Benicio del Toro, uh, right? Yeah, Did yeah. the soundtrack for that? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Benicio Morricone. Ben- Benicio Di Giorno, I believe. Uh, yeah, so it's just like a stunning, uh, soundtrack. The visual effects were done by a a young fellow at the time named Rob Botin, who kind of like when you were talking earlier about the stunts and and Raiders and how Mm -hmm. that wouldn't happen anymore. A lot of the ways that he achieved the, the hours that he worked to achieve the special effects and also the materials he used to achieve the special effects, I don't think would be allowed in the same room as human beings now, but, uh, it's like... It's so over the top at times. Uh, oh, it's so disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Every scene is, it, it's probably even more disgusting than intended. <laughs> yeah, like, it's revolting and truly, <laughs> truly horrifying. Uh, and again, there's, there is some stop motion work at the end when, when the creature finally becomes like too big to um, tell with, a, you know, a practical effect or a costume. Uh, in the mm-hmm. room, they they turn to stop motion and again use the same team that did uh, the mm-hmm. work on Jedi. So, mm-hmm. what you got next? Um, let's see. I, I feel like I had one more thought I wanted to add about the thing. Oh, sorry, no, on. I didn't mean to pivot. Uh, no, it's okay. I, I can't. I can't remember what it is, so it must not be that important. Mm. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Oh, man, Back to the Future. Okay, another movie that I have absolutely loved since as far back as I can remember watching movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and another movie, again, like uh, Ghostbusters, where almost every line of dialogue is comedic brilliance, mm-hmm. and most of it, and even the stuff that's not like, you know, Ghostbusters definitely has some, like, not raunchy, but definitely aimed at adults mm-hmm. uh, dialogue. Oh, it has raunchy dialogue. Uh, uh, yeah, Back to the Future does as well, too. But there's also, like, a lot of, like, you know, pseudoscience. It's, like, it's funny because it's so crazy. Mm-hmm. But like when you're a kid, you don't you can't identify like <laughs> wacky movie science from real science. Yeah, yeah. So you don't laugh at that stuff. You're just like, okay, it's interesting. I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there's a lot of that stuff in uh, in Ghostbusters or, or sorry in Back to the Future where I was just along for the ride. I enjoyed the characters and the adventure and didn't get how funny every single line of dialogue or how brilliant it was until much later. And I was like, wow, this is just genius on every level. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Yeah, the Libyans. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's funny to like like watch like yeah. like the enemy du jour. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, watch how that changes over time. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's why I like Spielberg won like by just like usurping all that. Like, let's just go back to like you know the original bad guy. <laughs> yeah, everybody hates Nazis and they will forever. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like um, this is never going to be politically incorrect. Yeah, casting Nazis like, hey, in a you're bad being way. a little hard on the Nazis, aren't you? No, I don't think you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, that, I mean, it's, 
it's brilliant storytelling and it's like it's pretty it's seamless enough or flawless enough so that when you can look at it with a microscope and really get into it and be like yeah but wouldn't this have happened like you know as far as like they they could have dialed it in much more than they did with the storytelling and and like the the timelines and all that stuff and like the little nods to like you know twin pines becoming one pine at the end because he ran over the tree <laughs> yeah. like they they really thought of I mean- yeah, that's that's like a subtlety that I didn't even pick up on until like the you know two hundredth time I'd seen that movie. Right, right. Uh, um, yeah, just like I don't know. I don't know if like I mean, I'm, you this may come as a surprise to you, and I hope I'm not going to ruin your day, Zach. But I'm not a scientist. <laughs> um, what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But you're the one that I've been listening to about <laughs> for advice on this pandemic. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're eating your blueberry muffins. The only <laughs> cure. Um. <laughs> Um, but I, I think that maybe, I don't know, like if to go back in time, were that possible, I feel like you just end up in an alternate timeline, right? Well, isn't that kind of what happens in, uh, in the second one? I don't know. Yeah, it's what happens. It's what happens in the second (laughs) one. We're kind of opening up a can of worms here trying to understand. No, no, no. uh, It it is what happens in the second one, but it happens, which the second one I just watched recently which is very, very dark. And it's actually, I don't enjoy it on the same level. It's still very good, but like, it's not, it, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't have the heart or the, 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 the optimism of, of the first one. Well, it's also hitting way yeah, too close yeah, to home. Super close right to home. Yeah. Too. Biff, Biff is uh, <laughs> yeah. president fuckface in, in that movie. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and, and the fact they base that on the man who is now real life president. I know, I know. I know. It's even more depressing. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> But, All right, let's steer away from politics. That's right. Um, but yeah, but that's as a result of Biff going back and 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 when it, they they almost didn't even need him. They didn't even need that plot point because they could have just sailed on him and like, oh, we went back and altered time, so now it's, we're this is the timeline that we're in. And then mm-hmm. you know, all they're doing is like jumping timelines, I guess. But like, whatever, yeah. whatever. It's fun. It, like, it's not. Like a movie like Interstellar, I feel like you can really look at like with a microscope. And even though I might not understand everything, or like 2001 is another one. Like, what is happening now? Mm-hmm. Like, I think I know what's happening, but like, you know, Back to the Future, I don't think should be held to the same, you know, uh, standards. Just because like it, it's it's a it's a fun adventure movie f- for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain yeah. point, like you know. Yeah, we need Einstein. We need Einstein to come back one minute later, you know, and and, yeah. and not, uh, you know, as a bunch of exploded particles or whatever would happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I mean, I, th- I think uh, again, I, I love the whole Back to the Future trilogy, but the first one in particular is uh, I th- it, because it's more like the time travel aspect and stuff like that becomes more of like the casing for the story mm-hmm. and not the story itself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's. A, a story about him like trying to keep his parents together and trying to like stop them from becoming basically the losers that they become in the future mm-hmm. and all that stuff you know like the, the whole thing is yeah basically him trying to repair his family mm-hmm. uh meanwhile also because he traveled in time he's trying to get home and all that stuff so i feel like there yeah there's a lot more heart and purpose to that and i think that both the sequels are great and brilliant in their own right but they do become more about like wacky adventures through time right. at that point, right. as opposed to the first one, which is about like, you know, I, I got to help my parents out while they're young. So yeah. things will work out for them yeah, they're lean- in the future. They're, they're leaning into the conundrum yeah. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the second two. And the first time, mean, yeah. the first one, like, it's awesome, no complaints, but it doesn't really practice what it preaches because they're saying, like, don't you know, we'll, you'll alter time. Like, the, just being there is doing that. And the fact that his dad <laughs> yeah. socked Biff, it changed their lives. Like, everything's different as a result of that. You know. Yeah, well, which I guess it kind of backs up what he said about altering time. Then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they get off on a technicality, although they kind of, whatever. It's fine. It's great. It's an awesome <laughs> movie. The soundtrack's amazing. The jokes are great. The special effects are awesome. Um, the story's awesome. The pacing's incredible. And the theme song is probably the second best movie theme song to Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. Or maybe maybe it's better. <laughs> it, it, and Ghostbusters maybe owes its existence to a song <laughs> written by the right. guy that wrote the theme it song for this one. It absolutely does. And I, th- I think there's a lawsuit that, that, that backs that up. <laughs> there is. Yeah. Um, my next movie, and, and so that movie wasn't on my five, and I'm not surprised it's in yours, um, uh, 
but it could be. You know what I mean? It's a it's a great mm-hmm. movie. Um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a movie that I cannot stop watching. Oh, so good. Um, God, now I'm sitting here thinking about. I I mentioned Interstellar in 2001. I'm like, should they be on my list? Because I really do love those movies. But mm-hmm. Close Encounters <laughs> of the Third Kind, I hold in high regard for a number of reasons. Personally, because it was a very early memory with my mom. We came home from some family function, and that was playing. That was like the the movie of the week. And I got to mm-hmm. stay up super late, and she made popcorn. We pulled it. We had a pull out couch, you know. So we pulled it out and mm-hmm. we got blankets and we watched that movie and it was just, I was really young and it was like, you know, that, that movie, like, like, um, Ghostbusters, there are moments in that movie that are genuinely scary. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when you don't really know what's going on with Richard Dreyfuss or what they're experiencing and the little boy there and, and, and the lady whose name I can never remember that, that they <laughs> end up reconnecting, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but so there's that, um, uh, there's also just th- there are no scenes in that movie that don't look incredible. And yeah. one thing I really appreciate about Steven Spielberg, at least the, the movies, if not the ones he produces, the, the ones he directs, he doesn't put in shots that, that don't work. And mm-hmm. not to say that like some special effects, you know, age a little bit, but like they, they still work. You know, they, like mm-hmm. I would say. They tell the story. They tell the story. Uh, or just look incredible. Like, I mean, Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. like, what you know still like it still holds up um and he's not afraid to use a mixed medium rather than just like telling it all in the box or um Mm -hmm. but close encounters uh there's a sense of mystery around it like the way they build it up like the way the you know the um you know the people like like all the uh planes and and missing ships like bermuda triangle mystery stuff like starts like showing up in weird places where it doesn't belong and that they they identify it as a world wide thing and then uh just like leading up to uh one thing i've noticed too if you watch if you what when watching that movie next keep your eyes on the sky and in nearly every mm-hmm. scene where there are stars you can see a spaceship moving just a tiny little oh, speck crazy. of light. Mm-hmm. So it's like even like and that, those are the scenes like leading up to like the actual reveal, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like the the truck scene where he, you know, gets flipped upside down and all that stuff. Or yeah. Um, but like, but then like you know, leading into the paranoia, like uh, Richard Dreyfus is like family coming apart, um, and you know, just you know, the neighborhood thinking he's crazy, and then the government making everyone think that you know, distracting them and, and playing it down with the whole anthrax or i think they used anthrax it was like you know killing all the animals so they just like got everybody out of the area and then just the mysteriousness of devil's tower as a as a monument as a uh, you know a strange rock shape on earth even that was like fantastic fantastical mm-hmm. like not fantastic it was fantastic man <laughs> it was fantastic <laughs> but uh yeah and then the way they played out the the way we communicate with uh others from other planets uh is the music yeah that was actually going to be my my big point to add in there is just that's so brilliant the using obviously music the the multi-universal language apparently Mm -hmm. well it's it's Uh, math it's so good they associated with it's math it's there's colors associated with each Mm -hmm. tone the way i don't know john williams man i mean yeah what a what a genius absolutely yeah dude can Bring so much to the story with just the yeah the the melodies and mm-hmm. the instrument choices and it's no wonder those guys keep going back to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one too. Where like all the shots like hold up and um, mm-hmm. and the performances are fantastic. And strangely enough, that's a movie that I didn't see until quite a bit later. Like I feel like I was probably almost twenty before I saw Close Encounters for the first mm-hmm. time. Um, and I think it's weird because I feel like that movie already occupied the same space that like the day the earth stood still does in my mind. Mm-hmm. Like back then, it was like, this is a classic alien movie mm-hmm. with a name that always gets associated with things. But for some reason, I haven't seen it yet, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know why it took me so long. Cause I've always loved Steven Spielberg movies, especially prime era Spielberg mm-hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, man, that, that is so good. Yeah, this was his follow up to Jaws. Mm-hmm. So um, that was a nice follow up. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, well, well done, yeah. Steve. I, that's one of those movies that it, it just, it moves me. Um, still, um, I've seen it many, many, many times and just the way it looks, the way it sounds, um, the pacing is, is really great and the performances are awesome. And I just, I just like, I like the story, like to, you know, it's a precursor to E.T., right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like aliens, not as the bad guy, but like, yeah, it's scary because you don't know what it is, but you know, yeah. they don't, you know, beings without malicious intent. Um, That's also one of those movies that, uh, you know, without sounding like a Dan Aykroyd here, mm -hmm. um, I, I believe, you know, I believe that there has to be some form of extraterrestrial, oh, me too. extraterrestrial yeah. life out there. Yeah. Um, and whether it's intelligent or not, who knows? But like, I would like, I believe that if there was like initial contact with extraterrestrial life would probably play out either like it does in Close Encounters where we're just like, what is going on mm -hmm. here and all the paranoia mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, yeah. And, and I guess the other one that always comes to mind when I think of how it might play out in real life if we ever actually communicated with intelligent life from elsewhere uh, would probably be like the movie Contact, Contact yeah. as well, where it's like, yeah, we're just getting weird signals or, you know. But but it also could be like Independence Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Not really. I guess depending on who who we get on the line, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yep. Welcome to Earth, losers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> that was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> Make the universe great again. Um, oh God. Uh, let's hope not. Uh, what do you got? What do you got for another movie, there, bud? Oh man, this is uh, the most obvious 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 thing that i could possibly bring to this conversation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but star wars yeah um now known as a new hope but i still just call it star wars mm -hmm. like while i acknowledge that empire is the the best movie of that trilogy technically That's how I feel. to me personally uh a new hope is or yeah i guess if i'm gonna call it that a new hope mm -hmm. <laughs> star wars just has resonated with me so deeply since since i was a kid like to the point where even Empire and Return of the Jedi are just like, yay, more Star Wars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, you know, again, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant John Williams music. Um, you know, such a like an obvious good versus evil scenario. Um, the bad guys are basically Nazis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Space, know, Nazis. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Space Nazis. Space Nazis. <laughs> no, it's really easy to get on board and root against yep. them. You know, and just, yeah, the story of the, the kid who comes from nothing and ends up, you know, blowing up the big the big Death Star and gets to swing around a laser sword for a little mm -hmm. bit. Like, that was uh, all, all of that. And, yeah, and, and the whatever, the loss of his aunt and uncle and all the life that he knew going forward, like, that resonated with me so deeply as a kid mm -hmm. and still moves me. Like, just yesterday, I was just listening to the soundtrack. I have the uh, the soundtrack on vinyl, mm -hmm. uh, like the original soundtrack release. And it's been resequenced just to fit on the sides of the records. Mm -hmm. So it's not presented on the soundtrack the way you'd hear it in the movie. Yet every single musical cue, I can picture yes. the parts and hear the dialogue. Yep. And it still, like, just fills me up with, like, that whatever childhood feeling of, like... I love this so much. Yep. You know, like my whole body is tingling. Yeah, yeah. There's something about these yeah. movies that we're we're talking about. All of them that, that when you think about them, and not to be like nostalgic about childhood, but like, man, things were so excellent <laughs> when <laughs> you know. And to look back, it's like were they excellent because you know, like you're looking at it like with rose colored glasses on, and just through like the you know, the whatever the mists of time, but. You know, but no, like these movies are excellent and better than yeah. anything happening right now. Well, and I, I think that's also like, you know, the other segments that we've been doing, the Desert Hold Up. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny because, yeah, when I was a kid, Romancing the Stone was like, you know, the, a next door neighbor to Raiders of the Last Ark. Yes. But as an adult, I'm like, Raiders, still excellent. Romancing the Stone maybe doesn't hold no, up. The, <laughs> not, 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 especially not comparatively. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but as a kid, it's like I saw those movies almost the same. Yeah, so it's like yeah, there there is merit to like I, we don't just love these movies because we love them when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Like these movies are actually that good. The all the movies on this list too are like oftentimes the the even though like the thing is a remake, um, it it's the first time these stories are being told or at least in mm -hmm. this way. 
Yeah. Um, so it has a it has some originality that is it's hard to come by these seemingly. Mm-hmm. Uh, seemingly, yeah. studios are having a hard time funding new ideas. Well, especially, I mean, so many of the things we've brought up, uh, yeah, they, they launched these franchises that get progressively worse mm-hmm. as they go on. Yep. <laughs> they really, they get further and further from the yeah. point. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, we could go on on Star Wars, but like, yeah, heard. Yeah, everybody's heard. already done. Everybody's already gone that's on right. yeah, Star that's Wars. Right. I, I love Star Wars. I do love Empire more. So if, if mm-hmm. I had to choose from the original three... It's, you know, Empire, Star Wars, number two, and Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Return of the Jedi, number three, but whatever, like, who cares? This is just my opinion. (laughs) What scenario are you going to be in where you have to pick one of the three? Yeah, I'm not going to pick. They're all great. The first three are (laughs) all great. Um, My next movie is also, uh, is like Star Trek II, a sequel, Um, and I'm not sitting here and saying it's better than the original, but for me... It just, it resonates more. I'm going to give all the credit in the world to the original. And if this were, like, I almost wish I could just, like, take franchises and put them on there as entries. But, like, um, Aliens, I think, Mm. is an incredibly successful movie. And I think why I like it so much and respect it so much is because James Cameron took a movie that shouldn't you should not have been able to follow Alien up. You shouldn't have been able to. Um, mm-hmm. It's just so original, and, and the H.R. Giger or Geiger designs are, are, are horrifying. The, the the concept of a parasitic alien that uses you as a host, you know, it's like, ugh, it's mm-hmm. awful. Um, uh, and it's it's so much suspense. I mean, much like the thing, like, yes. you know, people trapped in a confined space with the thing that wants to kill you. Exactly, um, exactly, that you can't really see because it hides so well. And it's you mm-hmm. can't destroy it because it has acid for blood. It's just like, you know, it's just... Alien is an incredible movie and, mm-hmm. and, and nearly flawless. Like, I think there's like like one shot in that movie that I'm like, eh, it doesn't really hold up, but like still is the best they had to work with at the time. And it, it tells the story, mm-hmm. who cares? And that's the explosion at the very end of the movie. But uh, mm-hmm. Aliens, I I love so much because James Cameron took, as I was saying earlier, a movie that you shouldn't have been able to follow up and did so by making a completely different movie. Yes, it has Sigourney mm-hmm. Weaver. Yes, the Xenomorphs are the the bad guy, you know, the antagonist again, Mm -hmm. but really actually the antagonist is actually Whalen yutani corporation. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It's more that, uh, I love that eighties. Yeah. The businessman or the bad guys. Oh yeah. 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 Paul Reiser who plays his role (laughs) perfectly. And he, instead of, he, yeah, it's still a horror movie, but really it's an action movie. And the first movie is a horror movie. They're both, if alien is sci-fi horror, then, um, uh, aliens is sci-fi action um, mm-hmm. and horror because there are some scenes in yeah. there that like you you can't unsee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah, I think it, you're absolutely right. Like the brilliance of that is he, you know, they could have just been like, let's put another alien on another ship mm-hmm. and have another crew. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. but instead, he made less of a sequel and just a movie that exists in that universe. That also happens to have the same protagonist in the center. That's of it. right, and and for um, them to like it, land people on whatever LV twenty seven forty one, but that have them land there and be doing their own thing for a while, and terraforming, and only by accident, or so we're led to believe, you know, mm-hmm. um, they come upon the the aliens and the face huggers and the eggs and all that stuff, and they infect themselves with. Xenomorphs. Although there's an argument to be made that Whalen Yutani sent them there to do exactly that for that reason. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah, and it was you know it was brilliant. Also setting it in the future, and also like putting that as part of Ripley's storyline too. This is one of those movies where I think the director's cut is like actually a lot stronger way better. than the theatrical way cut. Better. Uh, because you get that whole thing that yeah she has been in cryo sleep or whatever for 30 years or something like 52. that in uh, 52. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. And it, during that time, like her daughter has died yeah. or, you know, all that stuff. Right. So she, 
just missed out on this whole portion of her life, even though she is exactly the same age as she was, mm -hmm. you know, when she went in. And so I th that plays into like the relationship that she has with uh, Newt, the little girl they find, and all that stuff. It, but the director's kind yeah, also it's tells another... Newt's backstory too. Oh yeah, that's right. Because it was it was her parents that uncovered the xenomorphs. Right. right? They they found the ship. And and stake a claim because they're uh, what do they call it? Uh, 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 prospectors. I'd be more mm -hmm. afraid of coyotes if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're prospectors on the planet, and they they find the ship, they stake the claim, and then all of a sudden, Dad comes back with a a thing on his face, mm -hmm. fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, this is another one that just strikes too close to what we're going through right yeah, now. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, just the the paranoia, and it, they didn't just make it about. Um, it, yes, there are more aliens in this, but it's not just. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't suffer from just just do more of everything. It's not that yeah. like, there are more because there were more hosts, there are more aliens, there are more eggs. And then, you know, even yeah. one of the people that ends up being the hero of the movie starts off because of the reputation of the androids from the first movie. And because of Lance Henriksen's awesome performance, like you don't know whether you can trust him. You just, cause he's so mm -hmm. cold, you know, and, and uh, not cold, but like calculated. He's, he's an android. But like, um, just the way they kind of played that, the way they played the, you know, um, you know, uh, why can't it? Bill Paxton is like the braggadocious Marine who actually is yeah. just like a, just like a mess when it, when it gets right down to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Overcompensating. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it, and it kind of tells that story or at least like what I'm familiar of, like, you know, military personnel where it's, it's a truly mixed bag of humanity. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's, there's people with heart. There's just people who just want to blow shit up, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, uh, Aliens, much like Star Trek Two, is a movie where at the core of it, you have, you know, a really strong character in Ripley. And then obviously her bond with Newt, the fact that she knows what they're up against and the Marines don't. Like, there's like all this like intriguing character angle to it that's really strong. You know, another great Sigourney Weaver performance. Mm -hmm. Um, but then on top of that, you've got tons of aliens and machine mm -hmm. guns and space And it's really stuff. thoughtfully, so it's like, thoughtfully presented yeah. as well, like maintaining the, all the, the design integrity of the first movie, but expanding upon it. And James, James Cameron, like you could watch like Avatar, which I did recently just to kind of like check in and see if it was. I think we watched that's it right, together. That's right. We? That's right. <laughs> um, like, you know, not as bad as when I, as what I originally had thought or, you know. Yeah. But like you can see his designs of the machinery in mm -hmm. that movie very much are like his designs in um Alien. It's like very functional. Yeah. Like what would this actually well, didn't be he, like? He started out as like a prop guy or something like oh, that. Right. Like I think he came up through the Roger Corman system no, where yeah. he started out as like a behind the scenes guy working on props and set design stuff. Something along those lines. Is that lines. how he got his gig uh, directing Piranha 2, uh, the spawning? That is exactly how he got his gig <laughs> directing Piranha 2. Uh, but when he was brought on to do Aliens, he was only brought on as a writer. No shit. Um, and then, of course, Terminator was a huge success. And he was like, well, I want to direct, too. And the fact that Terminator was low budget and made money. Mm -hmm. They're like, all right, we can trust this guy. But they also slashed the budget like in half at that point because they didn't totally trust him. Right. They're like, we know that he can make a low budget movie that w might make his money back, mm -hmm. but we don't trust him with the budget that we'd initially allotted for this. Right. Um, so I think like a lot of his, like the fact that he came from a, like a practical effects or set design mm -hmm. prop background mm -hmm. uh, helped him like achieve that look you know, for the money he had available. Like, um, I actually went to a screening of that in LA. Mm. Um, is that Los Angeles? Where they had, uh, that California? is. California? <laughs> that's USA? Los Angeles, California. Um, yeah, I went to a screening of it at the Egyptian theater where they had, it was actually Alien and Aliens, oh, wow. but they had a QA and a with people that uh, had worked on some of the props and effects and stuff for Aliens afterwards. And like, they were just talking about stuff like the, um, the cryopods. Like, I think you see eight of them on screen. Mm -hmm. They only had props for four of them. So they set up a mirror. Yes. You yes, know, like yes. on, on screen. Yeah. And that was the other thing. They said they had no money for post-production. So everything that you see in that movie was captured on camera. They found out a way to like box. make it work on set and then they captured it on camera and there it is. That's how yeah, you see I it. I think maybe the only scenes where that 
might not be true would be when the the sh- the shots of like maybe the uh, drop ship from the Sulaco or I think it's called the Sulaco, but the sh- you know the drop ship like that. There's a little bit. Yeah. Of, there, there's very little post work in that. And then yeah. also like when the drop ship picks picks uh, Singorni Weaver up, there's some shots there, but certainly not much. Like every everything was practical and caught on camera in the box for the most part, which is what makes it visceral and real feeling because those people are really in those environments. Like uh, James Cameron had this awesome technique of projecting behind, projecting scenes behind people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like there's a, a scene where the first drop ship crashes because there's an alien on board, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. When they wait after after they go in, they 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 pull out and they're yep. waiting for the drop ship. There's an alien on board, kills kills the pilot, and then that ship crashes and spewing debris all around them. But if you look at it, like none of it actually like is near them. They just the way they frame it, it's all projected on a screen behind them. And it's so cool because like they, you know, they're reacting to something in real time as opposed to like now it would be like standing in front of a green screen. Yep. <laughs> all right. Pretend the thing is coming That's out. That's right. Yeah. Ah! Yep. All right. Um, did you have another movie? Did we get through the whole thing? Uh, I, I lost count, honestly. <laughs> did uh, you talk about your five movies? But, uh, did I? I said, what did I throw out there? I threw out Ghostbusters, uh, Raiders. Uh, you threw out Star Trek 2. Right. Well, we both we <laughs> right. both did. Oh, we, oh, that's true. I guess, yeah, you're right. That's uh, Star Trek 2. Yeah, I think that's five, right? And then you did Back in the Future, and you did... Yep. What's that? Uh yeah, I think there's another one. What are we? What are we what I are think we there's doing? one more movie oh, in Star Wars. Oh, Star Wars. That's, then one that was your movie? five. Yeah, that yeah. was your five. Yeah. Well, um, I thought maybe at the beginning we'd align a little bit more on the the actual five. Um, but I will say that I am not surprised in any of your choices, and I, even though they they didn't make my list, I would happily uh, defend your honor in your absence were someone to <laughs> take on with you. your choices. Yes. Uh, same. And the thing is, uh, on, on a different day, I, I could have said any of the movies that you said, mm-hmm. these were just the ones that, you know, and you said, don't write it down. Just your, t- your five favorite movies. Just go. go. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah well, let's do it again. Don't think about it. And then, uh, uh, just, just don't even think about it. And then I'll, I'll send you the text and that'll be the call. Yeah. Five <laughs> movies right great. now. Five movies go. Or we could do albums. We can do all kinds of uh, five things. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. all of these presented in no particular order of number one to number 10, or, or I guess it would be eight in in this case, because two of our choices were the same. Um, because choosing the top five movies is, is a, a stupid endeavor. <laughs> 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 it's stupid and it's dumb. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like if I'm going to get into like technical considerations of why this is good, uh, that's then I got to sit down and write down things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easier just to be like, you know what? I love Star Wars. Well, you know what? <laughs> if you have to sit down and, and, and dissect technical considerations to determine whether or not a movie is good, then maybe you just need to go with your gut and go with Star Wars because it's just fucking good. You don't need <laughs> yeah. to think about that. Yeah, exactly. You don't need to think about it. And, and that's not to disregard, you know, independent cinema or like origin cinema, anything like that. Uh, obviously, there's there's great things to be found everywhere. And there, there are great movies that have been made post-1986. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe actually the next time we should do our top, our top five 90s movies. Oh, that's a great idea. Because all of these movies are definitely from the 80s, <laughs> except for Star Wars and <laughs> except Close for, Encounters. Uh, and Close Encounters. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Which we're, I think we're both being made at the same time. Yeah, the, the, both of those movies <laughs> invented the decade that they thrived in. You know? yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. I'm happy to be here anytime. All right. I mean, this. I think this, this, uh, this pandemic bullshit is going to go on a lot longer than than we like and um i'll talk to you about movies all day and, and if people want to listen great <laughs> absolutely <laughs> this has been really fun for me <laughs> same this is basically the only interaction i get with people outside of my family well, so let's we'll keep it going, let's keep it going. <laughs> i'll take yeah, it i mean oh, sorry. i mean i mean inside of family <laughs> right like we, you and i would have this conversation anyway anyway we're just recording it <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, and usually people would tune out to what we're talking about, but everybody's hopefully as bored as we are that they'll want to listen. Yeah, I mean, if, if you've made it to the end of this, you clearly <laughs> wanted to hear about it or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
And you win. Nothing. You win nothing. Uh, the attention. <laughs> yeah, you win nothing. You win the ability for us to do this again and for me to make another episode of this show. <laughs> That's yeah. it. F plus. All right. I'll talk to you. Uh, I'll talk to you soon, Zach. I look forward right, to it. Bye, dude. All right. Bye bye. It's time for happy hour. Presented by Main Spirits. We keep the train rolling. We keep showing you how to make the drinks at home. Because why feel like you have to go out? It's nice to go out. It's nice to go out and have a drink. It's nice to go out to a nice bar and have a nice drink. Nothing will replace that experience. But what we can replace is you drinking like crap at home. So we can fix that. So that's what we're doing here at Happy Hour. Today, we are going to learn how to make a classic cocktail that's got some very, very fundamental ingredients. We're doing a kind of a twist on that, and we're going to show you how to make a sidecar. Now, we are going to make ours with brandy. Why? Because we had some brandy, some nice brandy for cooking, and it's actually quite nice and tastes great. So let's learn how to use that in a take on a sidecar. So for tools, we'll need a shaker, a strainer, a jigger, and a small plate. For ingredients, we will need, instead of cognac, we're going to use a nice brandy. We're going to use Cointreau, lemon juice, and superfine sugar. Let's build this thing. If you don't have superfine sugar, because who does, you can make your own by adding regular sugar to a food processor or a mortar and pestle and grinding it into a fine powder. So, spread the superfine sugar on a small plate, kind of like if you were going to rim a margarita glass with salt. Rub lemon wedge halfway around the rim of your glass. Dip the rim in sugar. Set that aside. In your shaker, add two ounces of brandy, one ounce of Cointreau, and a half ounce of fresh lemon juice. Now add ice and shake until you look like an idiot. I mean, I'm sorry, until very cold. Then strain into your prepared glass. You could either use a martini glass or a coupe glass for this drink. So now, let's take a sip. The Brandy Sidecar, another simple classic cocktail, or a slight variation on a classic cocktail, brought to you by Happy Hour, brought to you by Main Spirits. Main Spirits can be found online at mainspirits.com, or you can download their app for your smartphone and search all kinds of recipes from this guy to many other people who know much more about what they're doing than I do. Uh, Additionally, you can follow them on Instagram at main underscore spirits. Thank you for joining us. And as always, we encourage you to drink deliciously and responsibly. Spencer Explores the Universe is brought to you by Main Spirits. You can visit them online at mainspirits.com or download their app or visit them on Instagram at main underscore spirits. The show is also brought to you by Bull Moose. Serving Maine and New Hampshire's music, movie, video game, and book and trinket needs since 1782. Also brought to you by Sun Tiki Studios at 375 Forest Avenue or at suntikistudios.com. Spencer Explores the Universe is a Mistakes Were Made production. 